Human kinetics is the study of how humans move and how we interact with the world around us through movement. Within the school, we have a number of uh, outstanding scholars in, in different fields that range from genetics, biomechanics, sociology, psychology, history. There's a great support community at the University of British Columbia. I mean, working together, I mean, participating in each other's studies and teaching each other the different skills that we need. The field in which I do work is uh, sport and exercise psychology. So we're, we're interested both in, in the broad field of sport performance and the psychological factors that, that might underpin that. But we're also very much interested in some of the social psychological factors that might be related to things such as exercise adherence. One of the things we encourage athletes to do is, is control the controllables. Just try and focus on those things that they have control over. If they try and ruminate or focus on those things that they don't have control over, then they're not focusing on the task relevant cues that are going to allow them to perform effectively. The physiological responses before you even actually start exercising are pretty incredible. You just have the idea of all that um, adrenaline that just comes from nervousness before you even get going. So usually in preparation for exercise, um, there is just that muscle response and a physiology response. From the moment that the runner hears the start pistol go off, that signal is going to get transmitted through the brain, down the spinal cord, and down through the motor neurons that innervate the muscles in, in the sprinter's legs. The anatomical configuration of the muscles and the starting position of the sprinter will ultimately contribute to how much force that muscle can generate. People who are very highly trained as sprinters tend to have the types of muscle fibers that can produce lots of force in a relatively short amount of time. So one area of our program is dedicated to understanding how the brain, the nervous system, and sensory organs contribute to human movement. And there are a number of faculty within our school that are particularly interested in balance control. Let's take a dynamic situation, such as when the hurdler comes into contact with a hurdle. There are a number of problems that the nervous system needs to deal with in order to prevent a fall. The first is to try to identify the most reliable sensory information that detects that there's been a compromise to balance. The second problem for the brain then is to try to integrate all of the information together to generate the most appropriate balance response. In the best case scenario, the brain is successful at achieving all of this integration and detection of sensory information to allow you to generate an appropriate response and protect against a fall and continue with your normal movement. We really don't understand how balance is being controlled and why falls occur. And so the best way that we can analyze that then is to recreate those falls in real life conditions within a laboratory. For example, we can use moving platforms that will translate or slide back and forth to mimic situations such as slipping on ice or having a subway accelerate underneath your feet. In combination with these moving platforms then, we use a number of tools to try to probe the nervous system to see what's contributing to a healthy balanced response. So for example, we can use electrodes that we can place over the muscles that can pick up electrical activity generated when the muscles are active and look at the timing of those muscle responses and how they're coordinated. We can also use small infrared emitting diodes, which we can place on the skin and use sophisticated cameras to pick up where they are in three-dimensional space. So we can recreate the types of strategies that people will use to recover their balance. One of the ways in which we can change the context of a situation for balance control is to use virtual reality. And we're actually one of the few schools in the world to combine virtual reality with moving platforms and these highly sophisticated neurophysiological techniques to look at how balance changes in environments such as standing on the top of a tower or standing on an icy surface or standing in a crowded room. Locomotion, whether it's walking or running, is such an automatic task in humans that we do it without thinking. Similarly for a sprinter, when they're running, they're not thinking about alternating left and right movements, 
alternating between flexion and extension in each limb. In fact, we know that neural circuits that reside within the spinal cord are capable of controlling the very basic pattern required for locomotion. It's actually fascinating how well the nervous system is able to adapt despite any injuries or diseases. And now we understand better that the brain adapts best when it experiences different types of movements. For example, somebody with an incomplete spinal cord injury, if you allow them to experience the movement of walking, we can help retrain people to walk again. One of the real strengths of our program is the value of place on undergraduate teaching. In fact, we have a number of prolific and highly capable professors here who are publishing extensively. But one of the things that each of them try and do is present uh, their research through their teaching and, and make this information accessible to undergraduates and making it relevant. So undergraduate students in human kinetics will have lots of hands-on experience through the courses that they'll take, a lot of which have labs. They also can gain lots of experience directly in research. We have several undergraduate student volunteers or summer research assistantships or co-op placements that they can take. Indeed, in my research program, we typically have between 10 and 15 undergraduate students who, who volunteer either through paid or unpaid research assistantships to contribute to my research program.